Well, good morning. We're glad you're here this morning on this 4th of July weekend. Hope you didn't get too wet coming in. Let's stand and worship together. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. And they tell me of that home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of that unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless days. Of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of that unclouded day. Oh, they tell me that he smiles on his children there, and his smiles drive their sorrows away. And they tell me there's ever come again in that lovely land of unclouded day. cloudless days oh the land of an unclouded sky oh they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise oh they tell me of that unclouded day oh the land of cloudless days oh the land of an unclouded sky oh they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise Oh, they tell me of that unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of that unclouded day. And welcome to Arcadia. We are so glad each and every one of you are here today. Hey, if this is your first time with us, a very special welcome to you. We're so glad you are here this morning. And we have a little gift for you. So before you leave here today, if you haven't yet, stop by our Welcome Center. Uh, we got lunch on us. Uh, we'd love for you just to take that gift card. Um, also, if you have your bulletin, there's a section in there. We do ask for you to fill out. There's about three questions on there. Fill that out and either drop it in the offering box or come by the Welcome Center again if you've already been there and drop it off again. However, you only get one Chick-fil-A gift card, so you don't, you don't get a second one. Um, yeah, that would be really cool. Uh, a couple of announcements to do have for you guys to be aware of. Uh, first of all, we just want to remind you, hey, it seems like it's so far away, but it's going to come up quickly. We are four and a half months from our Samaritan's Purse End Gathering. Um, and as always, hey, we got soccer balls with pump, um, or always what's desired, so that's one specific thing to collect. And more information will come as we go, but guys, as we know, it seems sometimes it's so far out to start announcing it, but there's such a need there, there's such an amazing ministry, so we just want to keep it in the forefront of your mind that, hey, it's coming, and it's never too late to start collecting, and it's an amazing ministry, and there's so much blessed as we come from that, so we're looking forward to being a part of that. Also, Upward Basketball Camp is coming up as well. It starts a week from tomorrow. Um, so hey, 
It's going to be from 12 to 3, July 10th through the 14th. It is $50 to register. But know that on July 6th, the cost does go up to $60. So register early. It's for kids going into kindergarten through going into fifth grade. So if you have a kid or you have a grandkid or a neighbor who you would love to invite, invite them. They would love for them to come out and learn some good basketball skills, but also hear about the gospel at the same time. Um, so that's an amazing thing. And before we uh, go into our corporate prayer time, I'm going to have Peggy come up, and she has one announcement, uh, final announcement about Mission Santa Fe. Good morning, everyone. My name is Peggy Anderson, and I'm the prayer coordinator for Mission Santa Fe. Every Sunday in July, we will have a special prayer emphasis for each one of you to continue your praying through the end of the month. And Mission Santa Fe is fast approaching. It will be held July the 24th through the 28th. This is a community outreach event at Rungi Park with the goal of engaging children and youth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Monday and Tuesday, July 24th and 25th, will be the Rungi Project from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Two days of fun activities. A giant water slide, petting zoo, pony ride, snow cones, popcorn, hot dogs and drinks, backyard Bible club with crafts, recreation, Bible story, and music. Wednesday and Thursday, July 26th and 27th, will be mission projects from 10.30 a.m. till 2 p.m. Helping at HIS ministry, participating in yard work or housework for disabled Santa Fe residents, paying for people's laundry at the laundromat, playing games with retirement home residents, cookie snack delivery to city offices and businesses, visiting the homebound, preparing freezer meals for those who may need them, and canned food drive. Each project will have the goal of engaging people with the gospel message and taking opportunity to pray with those we meet. We will end the week on Friday evening, July 28th at 8.30 p.m. with a community outreach uh, movie night at Rungi Park. The Mario movie will be seen. This event is free to the public and the gospel will be presented and you'll have popcorn and drinks will be served. The Mission Santa Fe team needs your prayer support. Today the team is giving out these flag wristbands as a symbol of unity and a reminder of freedom that we have. Let your wristband remind you to begin praying now for Mission Santa Fe as we reach the Santa Fe community with the gospel of Jesus Christ through the Rungi Project and Mission Projects. And if you did not get your wristband, I will be in the foyer with some. Thank you. And be sure to sign up over at the Member Center. If you are going to help us this year, we'd love for you to do that. And if you have a kid who wants to be a part of it, the sign-ups are back there at the Member Center. Jim? Speaking of prayer, let's pray for our country. God loves our country. He founded it, established principles for it to function. But as we well know, there are things going on in our country today in which we just need to desperately pray. And so I want to read a passage of scripture that I think is so appropriate. And it may not seem like it talks much about our country, but it tells us what God expects of us. He says, this is what the Lord says, don't let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth. Heavenly Father, this morning as we come before you, Father, the Sunday before we celebrate our nation, its independence, Father, we're so mindful of what you have done in establishing this nation on the principles of your word. And so, Father, this morning we want to lift up our nation to you. I know Tuesday we're going to be doing a variety of things, and Lord, having time with our family, our friends. But Father, help us to also remember that, Lord, we need to be praying for our country. But Heavenly Father, we need to ask for your grace, for your power, for your provision. And Father, that we may return to you and be the country that you desire for us to be. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you, Father, for what you're going to do in bringing real revival to our nation. 
In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. There was a man named Thomas Kinn who lived back in the 1700s. He was a, a professor and one of the first hymn writers in England. Uh, before him, only psalms were sung, and he was a, a professor and taught his students to sing these hymns, you know, at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or, you know, right before bed. Um, and he was known as kind of being um, a rebel in a way. The king had uh, had this lady on the side, and he wanted him to house her in his parsonage, and he refused to do it, defying the king. Later, he, even though the, the king didn't crack down on him, he came up against another king whose name was James II, who uh, had some decisions regarding opening the kingdom to other religions, and uh, this, this preacher, Thomas Ken, uh, refused to, to do that and fought with the king about it and ended up being thrown in prison in a tower. Despite what he went through, he stayed firm in his convictions, and he trusted God, and uh, he's the one who wrote this next song that we're going to sing, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Despite what we go through, what we face, we need to cling to God, know that he is in control in all circumstances. Would you sing with me? Would you stand? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy and heavenly saints proclaim. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of His great name. Let us exult on bended knee. Praise God the Holy Trinity. Praise to the King, His throne transcends, His crown and kingdom never end. Now and throughout eternity, I'll praise the One who died for Father, Son, and 
of my God If it's for your glory then it's for my good I know you're with me you will not forsake me If it's for your glory then it's for my good My God is with me what could stand against me There's no greater love than there's no greater love than this, no greater love than you, Jesus. There's no greater love than this, there's no greater love than this, no greater love than you, Jesus. If it's for your glory, then it's for my good. I know you're with me. You will not forsake me. If it's for your glory, then it's for my good. My God is with me. What can stand against me? There's no greater love than this. There's no greater love than this. No greater love than you, Jesus. There's no greater love than this. No love than this no greater love than you Jesus thank you Jesus that there's no greater love than yours the splendor of the king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing it out. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. H to H you stand for.
praise and my heart will sing how great is our God name above all names worthy of all praise and my heart God, how great is our God, oh sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Lord, you are great, and you are worthy to be praised, Lord. We worship you. We thank you for blessing us in so many ways, Lord, blessing us with this country, blessing us with the freedom to come before your throne and worship you openly in this house today. Lord, you are so good to us. You've given us more than we could ever have dreamed through your son and the sacrifice he made on that cross for us. We just pray that now you would speak to our hearts, that you would open your word to us, that we would learn, that we would grow, that we would mature in our faith that we might be your light as we leave these walls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. All right. Good morning, church. Hey, I am so glad you guys are here. For our friends watching online, thank you for tuning in as well. I love the holiday of Independence Day. I love this time of year, uh, summertime, fireworks, the grilling out. Not that I grill out. I make my wife do it because she's a way better cook. So, But uh, listen, I try to dress as patriotic as my closet would allow me. Uh, this is as red, white, and blue as I could get, get without putting a flag uh, over uh, my shoulders. But I want you to know something, friends, as we start this morning. Listen, this is, this is how God has done this. Uh, he has chosen our nation uh, and, and has, within our nation in the last 200 or so years, created uh, a, a perfect situation to where we've been able to be a blessing to the rest of the world. Uh, he has blessed us materially and, and, and with wealth, and, and we're probably the richest people to ever walk the face of the earth. Uh, he has given us an abundance of, of things and ideas, and, and he has created a situation here that is, uh, ha has a flourishing economy. Uh, but also there's, there's Christianity, and it has flourished well in the past 200 years uh, or so. And uh, within that has come the ability to bring the gospel to the world. God has used our nation uh, to bring Jesus, the good news, to the world, and it continues even to this day, and, and I thank God for it. And I think we need to thank God for our country and, and for uh, the freedoms we have to be able to do this. Uh, do you know what we're doing this morning is illegal in many parts around the world. Uh, there are literally over 2 billion people who have never even heard of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Uh, so God has really blessed us here in this nation, and I thank God for our nation. I think we need to often pause and thank the Lord for what he has given us here. Uh, and I think as we go into the 4th, as we go into Tuesday celebration, whatever you're doing, whether it's cooking out, going to the beach, hanging with family, taking the day off and resting. Remember to thank God for the nation and for what he's done through our nation. I hear a lot of grumblings. Well, this administration and our nation this way, and even grumblings against the church. There's some disenfranchisement with the church. And listen, I want you to know God is still doing amazing things through his people in this nation. In fact, in this last three or four weeks, we've had 47 people put faith in Christ through the ministries of Arcadia. Praise the Lord for that. Isn't that amazing? Yes, our, our children are coming back from camp today. We'll hear reports of salvations. Our youth are going to camp this coming week. We'll hear reports of our salvation. So y'all pray for Cody. He needs to get saved. But otherwise, I mean, <laughs> listen. <laughs> so I, I think that, uh, that God has used our church. I'm excited to, to, to tell you that. Uh, but uh, with that being said, let's move on. Let's jump into the Word. So we uh, started a couple weeks ago a, a new sermon series for the summer called Back to the Basics. And we are looking at some foundational things that we deal with as Christians. 
Uh, the first week, we talked about salvation. Why is it important? What is salvation? We looked at the story of, of uh, Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Last week, we walked through the theology of baptism. And uh, going forward, we're going to look at uh, the Lord's Supper in depth. Uh, we're taking the Lord's Supper today, but we're going to look at it deeply in the next week or two. We'll talk discipleship, church membership, just some of the fa- uh, basic foundations of our faith. But today, we're going to talk about missions and evangelism. And as we follow through, you'll understand why. We're going to look at several things. We're going to see missions in the Old Testament, missions in the New Testament, and then missions for us. How does it apply to us in our local context here? And then at the end, we're going to hear a testimony of someone who has answered to the, uh, the, the call of God uh, and, and done exactly that, gone, gone somewhere to share the gospel. But let's first talk missions in the Old Testament. I'm going to call out a few scriptures. These are not going to be on the board. You can write them down and look them up later. Uh, but I want to give you just a quick history of missions. And any time you look at the history of missions, you have to go all the way back to the Old Testament. All the way back. What's funny is so often our church's view, current church's view, not necessarily our church, but the church, the view of the Old Testament is, is generally marked with uh, this idea that it's not as important as the New Testament. And a lot of times we view the Old Testament as non-missional, non-evangelistic. We don't see the mercy there that we see in the New Testament. And, and sometimes we even say that maybe the, New, the Old Testament is not applicable to us, to the church. However, when we look back into the history of missions, we start with the Old Testament, and we're going to see this today. Listen, I want you to know God is the same yesterday, today, and in the future. And he never changes. And if he is missional in the New Testament and and missional now and missional in the future, then he's definitely missional in the Old Testament. And his desire has always been since the beginning of time that the nations know him and his mighty works. In fact, we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and we start with the promise of the Messiah. The the proto-eongelion, as they say in the ancient language. It's the first evangelism, and and we see this in Genesis 3.15. What happens? Well, man sinned, everything is cursed, and humanity is condemned to die. But right in the middle of all of this, God says something incredible to to Adam and Eve. He's cursing man and and woman, and and by the way, we we work and we sweat, and it goes back to Genesis 3.15, right? So when you get to heaven, have a little combo with Adam, all right? if God's going to allow that. All right, but listen, this is what he says. He says this to the serpent. He says, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, and he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And so what we have here, if you begin to break it down, is this promise in the middle of all this cursing. God says, don't worry, though. Right now, things look look, look gloomy, and, 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 and it's doomed, but in the future, there's coming one. We're going to call him Messiah. There's coming one who will provide salvation for the world. And this promise of Messiah carries over to Abraham later in Genesis chapter 12. You can follow it all the way through the Old Testament. God reveals himself to Abram, uh, later calls him Abraham, but, but the promise of Messiah carries over to, over to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, he says, Abraham, I'm calling you out, and, and a long time ago I made this promise, Messiah is coming, and through you and your descendants, Messiah will come, and you're going to be a blessing to the nations, is what he tells Abraham. And so this promise of Messiah carries to Abraham, revealing God's missional attitude, not just for Abraham's descendants, the Jewish people, the Israelites, but he says for the nations. <clears throat> and so we see that promise go all the way through Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, down to Judah. And then what happens? Israel gets uh, pulled into Egypt and they're stuck in slavery for 400 years, doom and gloom. <clears throat> but we know how, how it ends. God raises up a man named Moses and Moses delivers Israel and brings them into the promised land. And then they, they establish themselves in the promised land. And, and then we see the rest of Israel's history play, play out, right? They, they live in the promised land. Joshua judges the time of the kings, the time of the prophets. And, and through their uh, wars and sin and being taken out and brought back, God's promises never fail. He continually reassures Israel, Messiah's coming, salvation's coming, and always is the talk of the nations knowing God personally. Always. In fact, one thing I saw this uh, last trip to Israel, more than ever, clearer than ever, was God's heart for the nations. It's interesting that God <clears throat> brought Israel to the promised land, and the promised land 
just happens to be a little bitty strip of land that connects three major continents where for the last 10,000 years, every major trade has gone through the land of Israel. In fact, right in the heart of Israel, right where the temple is, sits the King's Highway and, and the Via Maris, and, and every people group travels through there, Africa, Asia, and Europe, and they find out about the Lord God through the placement of his people. And so even in that, we see God's missional attitude. But as Israel lived in the land, they lived out their life, God used Israel to bring the peoples to himself. <clears throat> Just about every book in the Old Testament mentions the missional attitude of God. Let me read to you, for instance, Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 41 and 43 says, Even for the foreigner, thank the Lord, right? Even for the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name, strong hand and outstretched arm, and will come and pray toward this temple. May you hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all the foreigner ask. This is what Solomon's prayer is. Solomon says, God, I know you want the people to know you, so all those foreigners that know about your name because they have passed through this land, they have heard of Israel, they've heard of what God has done, may you hear their prayer. And then he ends his prayer with this, then all the peoples of earth will know your name to fear you as your people Israel do. And so here, even far back in Solomon's day in the Old Testament before Christ, right, this is B.C., God wanted his name known among the nations. He's missional in attitude. And then we go to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. On that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will look to him for guidance, and his resting place will be glorious. We see it with King Saul. We see it with prophet Isaiah. There are many passages throughout Isaiah where, where continually the people are called, uh, Israel is called to, to be a witness to those around them. Verse uh, 6 of chapter 42, Isaiah. I am the Lord. I have called you for a righteous purpose, and I will hold you by your hand. I will watch over you. I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations. Isaiah 49, verse 6. You are a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. <clears throat> Man, there are many, many, many passages we could read that show God's missional heart in the Old Testament. Psalms consist of over 175 references to God, uh, of God and God's people reaching out to the nations. In fact, you look at Psalm 47, 67, 100, all of them talk about uh, letting the whole earth shout triumphantly to God, all the peoples. We get this image of many people believing in God. Psalm 9, 11, sing to the Lord who dwells in Zion, proclaim his deeds, where? Among the nations. And you know, we're doing exactly that right now. We're literally fulfilling what was written in Psalm 9. Psalm 105, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, proclaim his deeds among the nations, among the peoples. Joel 2, after this, I'll pour out my spirit on all humanity. Zechariah 2, many nations will join them. Malachi 1, my name will be great among the nations, among the people, the Goyim, the non-Israelites. And so time and again through the Old Testament, as you look at the history of missions, God is saying, I want the people to know me. Even though back then things were a little different, you had, to, you had to come into Israel to be a part of Israel, it was kind of pulling you inward as a proselyte, now, now we're sent out, right? God still wanted the nations to know him. And think about what he did in the Old Testament. Many people in the Old Testament were non-Israelites. Rahab, Ruth, and they're mentioned in Jesus' genealogy. And then you have the men who were working with David, his warriors, some of Solomon's men. Uh, and, and that list goes on and on, that God used the nations, right? And so this idea in the Old Testament is, that God wants the nations to know who he is. Let's start there. And then we go to the New Testament. Let's talk about missions in the New Testament. Now, we know when we turn to the New Testament, we think, obviously, the New Testament's missional. Obviously, right, when you look at Jesus' life and the things he taught, the things he did, his commission, and then what the apostles did in the book of Acts, let's, let's break some of these down. Just real quick, Jesus' mission in Luke chapter 4, it says he came to bring healing he came to bring freedom to the captives. And then we go to John 3, 16. He says something similar in a different way. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, no matter what your ethnicity is, no matter what your background is, believes in him will receive eternal life. He came into the world not to condemn the world, but that through him the world may believe. And, and so even in Jesus' teaching early on, we see this idea that Jesus is saying, I've come to the world to bring salvation to the world. <clears throat> not just one people group, not just one nation, not just one period in history. This is for all peoples. And then we go to Mark chapter 19, five, 
Mark chapter 5, verse 19. I love this. You need to write this down. Mark chapter 5, verse 19. I'm going to do a whole sermon on this one day. Jesus and his uh, apostles are hanging out in the north end of the Sea of Galilee. They uh, come across this, this dude. He comes out of a, he comes out of a, a, a cemetery. There's, there's, there's tombs everywhere, and, and he's full of demons. <clears throat> and he's acting crazy. He's chained down, but he busts the chains. And probably hadn't showered in a bit. Hair all wild and matted and they encounter this guy, and everybody's kind of fearful, and Jesus says, hey, demons, uh, what's your name? And they're like, legion, for we're many. And he's like, get out of here. And they go into a bunch of razorback hogs. I meant <laughs> hogs. I didn't mean that, Jim. <laughs> they go to a bunch of, a bunch of pigs, and, and they run off the cliff and die. So it's this kind of weird, uh, weird supernatural story. And then the man comes to his senses after the demons are gone, and he falls at Jesus' feet. He worships him, and, and he's like, Jesus, like, this is crazy. Like, you have freed me, and I'm in my right mind. They've got him cloaked. He's sitting around a fire, drinking some hot soup, recovering, recouping, and then he says, Jesus, I need to follow you. I'm, I'm ready to go. Let's get in that boat. Let's go. High. I'm, you're my Lord. You're my Savior. And Jesus' response to him is this. In Mark chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus did not let him go with them, but told him, go home to your own people, and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So he went out and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, the ten major cities and on the, the, the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, how much Jesus had done for him, and they were all amazed. Man, you tell me this guy met Jesus. He got saved. And immediately was set free and, and, and had this crazy encounter with Christ. His life was changed. And Jesus' first rule to him was, you go and you tell what God has done for you. That's the first step. And he did it. And listen, what you need to know is, in the Decapolis, it was fiercely non-godly. It was a, a, a moral uh, collapse was happening in those, those ancient Roman cities. And this guy went out and began to share his, his testimony. Hippos and some of the other ancient Decapolis cities soon after became major centers of Christianity. Before long, shortly after the time of Christ, they became some of the first megachurches, sending out missionaries all over the world. And I think it probably started with this man in Jesus' ministry, but this man went back and reported what God had done for him. We see this several times throughout the New Testament. People will have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Their life is, is drastically changed, and Jesus commands them and says, look, I want you now to go and tell what God has done for you, and they do it, and lives are changed. So friends, when we think missions, evangelism, this is what I want you to start thinking about. We put faith in Christ. One of the basic foundations after that is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, sharing our testimony, telling others what God has done in our lives and the change that he brought us. That's why it's important we see testimonies in our bulletin, man. We want to see what, what has God done in your life. Man, I love hearing stories of life change. This is, is, is something that we see played out in uh, Jesus' ministry. You know what he did with the apostles just after this, man? He took them and sent them out two by twos. And he said, look, you guys, don't take anything with you. Go into the surrounding villages and towns and share that Messiah has come and people need to repent and believe. And they did. And they came back and gave a mission report. And he does this several times. And so we see him commissioning his apostles out. At the end of Jesus' ministry, we come into one of the greatest texts that we all know called the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28. At the end of Jesus' ministry, he preps them and trains them over the course of three years. And then he's like, hey, I'm going into heaven you guys are my tools to take the gospel to the world. Go, therefore, make disciples of a few nations. No, all peoples. Go into all nations. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. So at the end, Jesus' final command, we see it in Matthew 28, Mark, then in Mark. He says, go. Go and share the good news. That's our commission. The commission was handed off to the apostles. They Hand it off to the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. It's been passed down all the way to you and I. So our commission, friends, is to go and share about Jesus Christ. Acts 1.8, we see the same thing. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Do you realize we're the ends of the world? <laughs> well, like, I know, like a long time ago, you know, probably our families immigrated here, but we are the ends of the world. 
And, and when we go into Mexico, Belize, South America, uh, you know, we're at the ends of the world, man. And, and, and so it's come true, but Jesus is commissioned to his apostles where you guys are going to be my witnesses. You're my tools that I want to send out. And we see as we go through Acts, man, we preached through Acts a couple years ago. We'll do it again in 20 years. <clears throat> we got a lot more to preach in between here and there, right? But some were called to stay where they were and be on mission there. Some stayed in Jerusalem. Some stayed in Antioch. Some stayed in Bethlehem or Bethshan or wherever else. Some were called to stay where they were. Some were called to go to the next town over. We see that with Philip. Some were called to go to the next country over. Some were called to travel like Paul to different countries all over the Roman Empire and plant churches. And so we see that play out in the mission of the church. And we see it again in 2 Corinthians, the command that we are to go and be witnesses for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. That's what Paul says. You and I, that applies to us. We're ambassadors for Christ. You know what an, an ambassador does? They go to another country and they represent their home, their home country. And, and that's us, friends. We're representing the kingdom of God in a foreign land. We're ambassadors. How cool is that? Maybe we should get little badges. It'd be kind of cultish. Never mind. <clears throat> Romans 10 for everyone who calls on the, I mean, you just see a bunch of us walking around with these weird badges on, right? Like, All right, that's kind of weird. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on him uh, who they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And so Paul reminds the Christians in Rome, man, going and telling is vital in our walk with Christ. It's one of our main and awesome responsibilities. All the way down to Revelation 7. After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. What a beautiful scene. God's heart has always been for the nations. Always. From Genesis all the way to Jesus, through the apostles, all the way to Revelation, his heart is for the nations, and the nations know him. So how does this apply to us? How does missions apply to us in our current context? Well, listen, there's several things here we need to understand. Number one, God's mission never stops. God's mission never stops. We need to understand this. It doesn't matter if there's war, pandemic, sickness, death. Our mission that God has given us, it does not come to an end. I've told you the story of my friend Johnny one time that had this muscular disease. He could only talk and see. He couldn't move his body. They put him in a nursing home where he knew nobody and was wondering why God had placed him there. I come in one day, looked at Johnny laying on the bed, complete lack of dignity because somebody had to feed him and bathe him, and, and he's a 90-year-old World War II hero. And then he says, I figured it out, Josh, why God brought me here. And I said, why? He goes, man, he's given me a whole new set of nursing staff and nurse aides and, and roommates to share the gospel with at the end of my life. Holy smokes. And I got full functioning, well, not my brain. Uh, I'll get, <laughs> listen, I'm on the spectrum somewhere. And I'll give you a list of my medications later, all right? But I've got full use of, of physicality, right? And, and I don't even go as, as, I don't even have the heart that Johnny had. Johnny had the heart of God, missional, go. How does it apply to us? God's mission never stops, no matter what our situation is. I loved, a couple weeks ago, we were in Israel, and we had a guy on our trip proclaiming atheist or agnostic from China, communist country, been here in the States for a while, learning. I have a conversation with him one day. The next night, Jim and I sit down with Zig, and I'm exhausted, so I'm just kind of tuning into the conversation, and Jim says, man, let me break it down for you. Boom, boom, boom. We're in Israel, and he's sharing the gospel with a Chinese person. The next day, I meet a girl from Seattle who married an Israeli. She's not an Israeli citizen, and I'm sharing the gospel with her. It's amazing, right? All peoples need to know the Lord. And that's what God's call is for us. The mission never stops no matter where you're at. If you're on a trip to Israel, if you're sick, if there's war. Secondly, we need to understand this. The church is God's chosen vessel to take the good news to the nations. I don't think, I don't think that registered. Let me re-say that. The church, you and me, we are God's vessel to take the good news of Jesus Christ. Life-changing news to the nations, all peoples, you and me. That means God chooses regular folk like you and me, Gun Barrel City, Texas. You got two people from around Gun Barrel City, Texas. How in the world y'all do that? Listen, Gun Barrel City, Texas, what good can come out of Gun Barrel? What good can come out of Santa Fe? But God has chosen people like you and me, not super saints, because they ain't none, all right? But he has chosen us to bring the gospel to the world. That means God has trusted us 
sinful, disobedient humans that are saved by grace with the most important responsibility in all of human history, and that is sharing the gospel. Man, I'm going to come down there and flip them pews for y'all, all all right? Listen, (laughs) man, y'all should have done flip them suckers over and ran up out of here. What God does is he takes people, sinners, people who love the world, saves them with his grace and mercy by the hearing of the gospel, changes them, and then he uses whatever resources he has equipped them with to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. That's amazing. That's a miracle. Praise the Lord for that. Yes. Listen, we are all in this room as believers in Christ, missionaries, all of us. Do you believe that? All of us are missionaries. Kind of scary, but kind of cool and exciting. Listen, there's been a change in the term of missions in the last 20 years. I think when I was younger, when I was just getting into college 456 years ago, uh, before I had gray hair, there was this idea that when we wanted to to do missions, we had to uh, go through a mission organization, jump on a plane, and go somewhere to some far and distant country. And, and, and And that's still a thing, but I think there's been a little bit of a change in the term missions. I think lately it's been used more for the believer, like we're on mission as we go wherever we are. But here's Here's the way it is. There are still people who are called to leave and go, and we, we, we praise God for that, and we want that. We want people to answer the call to go. In fact, one of our main goals here is to raise up men and women who have a desire to go to a different cultural context with the gospel, and we want to equip and connect and pray and love and support them. And if that's you, I ask you now to answer the call. If you feel God's calling you, come talk to us. Let's have that conversation. We want to pray for that. Listen, I want our church to be a sending church. I want us to raise up men and women who will go and serve God. And maybe not, maybe not, maybe God hasn't called you to do that. Most of us probably are not called to go. Most of us are called to be missionaries where we live in our current context. Our current context includes our our workplace, our school, our friends. Listen, God has you where you are for a purpose, and he wants to use you right where you are. There's this concept in Acts 17. I don't want to dive too deep into this, but in Acts 17, he says, from one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole of earth and has determined their appointed times and boundaries of where they will live. And so God has you right where you are in this geographical boundary, in this time zone, this time boundary, and he wants to use you as a believer in Jesus Christ to reach the people around you. You go to work and you're like, man, that coworker drives me crazy. Stephen says that every time he comes to the office. (laughs) Listen, God has you there to be a missionary for them. You go to school and you got your friends, college, high school, whatever. You got your family around you. God has put you in your family. My kids, they're my my mission project. My goal is to have them put faith in Christ and train them and send them out. I I believe God has given me these these kids, however many I got, I got so many kids now. Listen, (laughs) I start calling them different names. God has given me these kids to raise up as missionaries. Wherever we are, our family, our friends, our school, our coworkers, God has you there, and you're a missionary where you are. I love it. This past week, I had, uh, I had several calls and conversations of church members sharing the gospel. One guy called me and said, you're not going to believe this, man. I was at work, and, and I've been praying about how to have a conversation with this guy on my shift, and God gave me the perfect opportunity. And I began sharing with him. It just began pouring out. Another person said, man, I was making a delivery and and had a perfect chance to share the gospel with this lady. And and I did. I took the chance. I love those conversations, friends. We are called to have the heart of God for the nations. All of us. So here's our church's view on missions. All of us should be involved locally, for sure. Where you are, where you live, where you work, that is your mission field. Also, our church is involved in local missions as well. We're involved in supporting the local Baptist Association, the Galveston Baptist Association, which I am the moderator. <clears throat> uh, so I make them call me Mr. Moderator there. So <laughs> we also support other local mission projects like the Pregnancy Center, right? Uh, we have plenty of those, uh, his ministry and other local missions. Also, our church has local missions that we're involved in. Hello, we got Mission Santa Fe coming up. You just got an armband. That's a great time to get involved in the ministry opportunity in our community. We want more of this. We need to be doing local missions first. We don't need to go somewhere else if we're not doing mission work here first. This is where God has called most of us. But as Acts 1.8 says, God has called us to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. This This is our Jerusalem. We're also involved in missions on a national level as well. 
We are connecting and have connected with several church plants in Seattle. We'll look for missions there. We'll love these people. We'll support them. Listen, Seattle needs some Jesus, all right? I can promise you they need some Jesus. That's our Judea, Samaria. We're also involved in missions internationally. We're going to get connected in the future with church planting in Belize. That'll be our uttermost parts of the world. But what I want you to know right now is this, is God has called you as a missionary and can use you. Maybe he's calling you to do something here. I pray you answer that call. Maybe he's calling you to preach, use your music talents for him. Maybe he's called you to missions here somewhere, somehow to start some ministry. Please answer that call. We'll help get you equipped and connected. Maybe he's calling you somewhere else. Maybe God's been stirring your heart and God's calling me to the mission field. I don't know. And if he is, we want to have that conversation with you. But I want to show you right now what God can do through someone in Santa Fe. God has used our church to win people to Christ, but he's also used people in Santa Fe to go somewhere with the gospel and win people to Jesus. I'm going to invite one of my friends up to share a testimony with us, one of our hometown boys. Many of us know Chris Stellhorn. He was here last year and uh, shared with us that God had called him to Scotland. A Santa Fe boy going to Scotland. How amazing is that, right? So he's been over there well over a year now, was in town this weekend. I said, bro, we're talking about missions. Come on down. And so Chris is going to share with us what God has done in his life. And I hope in turn it will encourage you to follow through in obedience. By the way, Chris gave me this. Loaded fries, Texan barbecue spices for, uh, from Scotland. And he said it doesn't taste anything like Texas. So uh, <laughs> there we have it. But Chris is going to come and share with us what God is doing in his life in Scotland through his family as he's been there on a, a doing mission project. And listen, after this, we're going to pray for him. And then we're going to celebrate what Christ has done for us and our freedom of Christ through the Lord's Supper. Good morning. morning. Well, uh, if you didn't know this, the ancient Romans actually considered Scotland to be the ends of the world at one point, even built a wall to keep them out. Um, But what if I told you that we live in a village of about 3,000 people, and we held probably the biggest event that has ever been held in that village? And I'll tell you about that in a minute. For now, let me show you a picture of the family. So you can see what we look like now. And uh, we've added one more that was born in Scotland. Her name's Gwendolyn. And I delivered her myself because the uh, midwives didn't show up and there's no room in the hospital. So I ended up delivering her myself. That's a, I added that to my belt. I think I need a badge for that because that was, that was pretty big. Uh, <clears throat> but it was a big change. One of the things about Scotland is there's no barbecue and there's no Mexican food, and so you talk about sacrifices. That's, that's a big one. Uh, there, there's, there's not even Tex-Mex or anything close, and I mean, anything labeled Texas is not good. Um, so uh, chili, for instance, yeah, I'm very traditional on chili, no beans, just meat. Uh, chili there is nothing like chili here. In fact, it's served with lots of beans, and you put it on rice and eat it with yogurt. Um, <laughs> Like, that was, that was, so there's a lot of changes. One of the things is, is at the grocery store, you can get baby food that comes with fish pie and green beans. Now, if you can do fish pie and green beans, why don't we have brisket baby food in Texas? That's, that's the only idea that, that came to me. So there's a lot of, they speak English, but there's a lot of word differences. There's even a lot of phrases that are different. Words that sound common here can be very different. For instance, if we were having breakfast next Sunday at church, and I said, I would like you to bring juice, what are you going to bring with you? Orange juice, apple juice, you know, something. Somebody's going to show up with soda. Because juice there, the juice aisle is soda. It's they're going to have Fanta, Coke Zero. You might have a, what's, like a d- diluting juice. And that's made of squash and black currants and something. But that's what's going to be showed up if you ask for juice. So there's just a lot of those little differences that you have to get used to to some of the terminology. And one of the ones that was strangest to me is right after we move, a fella came up to me and says, Hey, in a few days, you want to go together and get a fine piece. (laughs) Explain that for me. Well, that's a dessert in Scotland. That's a dessert. So, okay, we, we can do that. <laughs> so where we live um, is in northeast Scotland. Uh, it's a place called Aberdeenshire. And uh, you might think of it as like the county of Aberdeen, the whole area outside of Aberdeen. And we live in a, 
Uh, uh, right now, we live in a village of about 3,000 people called Old Meldrum, and we're moving, well, actually two days after I get back, just 10 minutes down the road to the slightly bigger area called Inverary. And uh, kind of in part because our rent house was sold because of the housing market there. And also, we're in the process of kind of the ministry of what we're doing, expanding its area and what we're working with. And so just so you don't, if you don't know this, but, but Scotland's uh, is an unreached people group. 1% of people in Scotland attend church regularly. That means once every four to six weeks. Four, three to 5% of people believe in Jesus and follow the basic tenets of scripture, or you might say the basic foundations of faith, as Josh said this morning. And so it's considered an unreached people group. By population percentage, it's less than China. <clears throat> Christians, as well, because of history, are viewed as fake, false, empty, people who don't live what they believe. They're not real. They're friendly without any repentance. Christianity there, by tradition, is love without obedience, religiousness without any relationship. And so it's an emptiness. And so to share the gospel, it means very much so rebooting that idea of what the church and who Jesus is in their eyes. And so it's sharing the gospel through relationship and building those communities. And so for many people, we come in and we don't announce, hey, we're the church, we're Christians. We come and we build relationships with them. And as they build relationships, they notice there's something really different here. And then they begin to find out, you're, you're part of the church. No, that, that can't be because this is what the church looks like but we've given them a total different image. And it's almost a reboot and a restart of their understanding. So we meet people where they're at. We make connections just like Jesus did with Levi at his tax booth or the Samaritan woman and met her at the well. And like the guys who were out fishing or went and talked to Zacchaeus at the tree and went home with him. So we meet people where they are. And so it might be, for instance, like the grocery delivery guy. And this week, uh, my wife got a grocery order and while she got the grocery order, she sent me this message, and she says this, the Tesco delivery guy was the young guy who came when we had the barbecue day at our house. Uh, he had came to deliver groceries that day. And I had actually invited him in, say, you want a burger, or you want something to drink? And she said, he went on and on about how you made his day with a cold bottle of water, and it's the nicest thing anyone has ever done when he was working. Told him, and so she relayed to him that we were moving just down the road, so we're not, not going anywhere. It would just be down the road. And so we continually just meet people where they're at and create these small, just hard bumps in their life that helps them see that there's something different. During the wintertime, we had some real bad snowy weather, and there was a male guy that was just walking, and he looked like he was having the worst day ever, walking in snow about, oh, this deep or so. And it was cold, very cold. We had been frozen in uh, our car for about 10 days or so. And so I ran outside with uh, a hot cup of tea and some Christmas cookies we had made and gave him Christmas cookies and he just stood there in the road and I said, you can come inside and warm up if you want to. I mean, anytime you're walking by and it's cold, just, just knock on the door, come use the toilet because there's not a lot of public toilets either. Just, just come inside, sit down, warm up if you need to. If I'm not home, just open the garage and go sit in the garage if you need to. And, and he just stood there and out in the road and drank his hot tea. And later, uh, a few weeks later, he, he caught me and he goes, you know what, that day I was thinking about quitting my job it's just, I was done. And he says, because of that, I had the hope to continue on. And so there's stories like when we had, there was a water tank leak in our house. So these water tank guys came and they spent hours in our house. And so continually, I just, I complimented them and I encouraged them. And, and when they went to leave, the guy turned around and he goes, you are genuinely the nicest person I have ever met in my life. And went outside, and what I always do with these guys as well is we invite them to this thing called Meldrum Men, which I'll share with you in a minute. But little things make big impacts. And those are things that we can do all within our life, within our local community, where we're living, is make these little impacts. And it's because of Jesus we do these things. And so Matthew 5, it said, let your light shine before others so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And so when we first moved, we began to focus on building relationships because we, we are very much the outsiders. I mean, we're not as bad as the English, and so Texans give you kind of a heads up there, but uh, 
um, we begin building relationships. And there's these free pages, because they don't like to throw anything away. So we'd go and we'd pick up these items off the free pages. And when they did, Shannon was having like this major medical deficiency at the time. It was for salsa, um, because there was no salsa. So she was like, you could see her just like wearing down. So I began to make homemade salsa. And as I did, is I began to put the salsa in little containers and take it and say, hey, would you try this? I said, I'm just working on trying to make some homemade salsa. Would you tell me if you like it or not, if it's good? I just like to get local opinion. And, um, and so people were like, oh, this is really neat. And so then they began to tell me later, oh, I like it, I don't like it, and, and that was important. And because in building relationships, there's a twofold process. One, we give people what we have and what we can. You know, gold and silver I do not have, but what I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. But then also, we ask people to invest in us by asking help, say, I, I, man, I'm just struggling. Can you, can you come help me move this piece of furniture? Or would you, would you tell me how this salsa tastes? Because a relationship is built by me investing in you and giving others the opportunity to invest in us. And there's a bond that gets built. And so, as it began to happen... We found out that, of course, uh, trick-or-treating in Halloween is a very American holiday, and so it's not real big over there, and, but we found out that people did do it in the UK, and it almost always happened on our street that we were living on at the time. So I threw a big event. I had hot chocolate, movie theater in the, in the garage showing Great Pumpkin and Charlie Brown, which nobody had ever seen, and roasted marshmallows outside, and we had 400 people come through our front yard which would be actually the front garden, using proper terminology there. And the end of the night ended with 60 teenagers spending about 45 minutes on our front, front garden. And so the, probably the biggest event that's ever been in Meldrum, even bigger than the Highland Games, if you can imagine that. So uh, through that, it created this first introduction to a lot of people, then where we'd run into people and say, oh, you're that house that did the, the roasted marshmallows on Halloween. And so there was automatically this beginning connection that began to be built. And we did curbside meetings where I'll be walking through town and people will recognize, we'll stop and we'll have a conversation and I'll talk and ask them how they're doing in their life. And through the past year, I spent a lot of time pastoring and discipling people and just lots of stories that we could share this morning of stuff that had happened. Folks young um, who are hearing about Jesus because most, the percentage in reality is, is that most of the kids, like Gwendolyn, who's born in Scotland, will grow up and never hear the gospel. They will never see a Bible, and they will never step foot in church except for a funeral or a wedding. And that's just the reality. Kids will not know Jesus and the gospel. And so it's a gigantic need. One of the older ladies that we started working with she was just locked in anxiety. She spent sometimes weeks in her house. She just couldn't do anything. At, by the end of the year, she was leading her own home group or home church. She was also leading a prayer and care group at a local cafe, and she was going and visiting people that were in need that were shut-ins. And so that's what Jesus is doing. And it's not us, because we are powerless on our own. It is the work of the Holy Spirit just using us and using everyday things and using the care and, and comfort and presence of people there. One of the men last year that I work with, he said this, he says, he says, thank you for the amazing work that y'all are doing in Old Meldrum. He didn't say y'all because that's not a terminology there. That's just me. <laughs> he says, you're a light shining in the darkness, salt adding God's flavor to the community of Meldrum. Keep doing what you're doing and being who you are and sowing into the community. And I really feel that the work that was started will still be felt for many years to come. And see, that's a big thing because Northeast Scotland is relationally cold. It is hard ground. There's, an, there's a beginning friendliness, and then there's a big gap until a relationship is built. For instance, there's a fellow from Ireland that lives in Meldrum, and he said once to me, he goes, I've been living here 30 years, and I'm just beginning to feel like a local. To give you an idea. And so God has done some amazing work in one year where even that when we found out that our house was being sold, we had over 50 people from Meldrum that stepped up and said, we want to help you find a house so you stay here. And that's, that's a really big thing for that area. And as well, one of the local uh, businessmen had told me, he said, he said, Chris, I think that Meldrum is better with you in it, so I don't want to see you leave. And so there's amazing things that God is doing 
in Meldrum and breaking that ground and softening it uh, for what is coming. Because the goal is we want people to feel like they have family. We want people to have hope when they have no hope. And so that's why we called ourselves Clan Stellhorn. A clan is someone who stands beside you and behind you, and they're there when you need something. And so one of the things we'll say is this, hey, if you're having a hard time, and just like the guys who, who replaced the water tank, before they left, I said, I said, I'm serious. I said, if you break down on the side of the road and you have nowhere else to call, you give me a call and you say, Chris, I need help, and I'm going to come help you. And so we provide that thing that many people just don't have. At one of our Meldrum men gatherings, I had shared uh, we were sharing around the room, like, what do you want people to remember about you uh, when you die the most? And I said, I just want people to remember that I wanted them to feel like they were family. And one of the guys across the room, uh, one of the new guys who had come had been my neighbor across the street. His eyes lit and he goes, that's exactly how I felt when I met you the first time. He goes, I felt like family. He says, and you came to my house. I invited you to come to my house and you actually showed up because no one actually shows up when you invite them to your house and you came and hung out with us and spoke, uh, spoke to us and sat down and talked to us. And the thing I share with you about this is because that's not naturally me because I'm naturally very introverted. On a scale of one to extroverted, I'm like a three on the introvert side. That's just not a natural thing. One-on-one -on -one conversations was a process that I really had to work on and grow with that the Holy Spirit had to grow in me. So if I can do it, anybody can really do it. I mean, in reality, the Holy Spirit works in us and moves us into places. And I shared the last time I was here that for most of my ministry in the United States, I have said, no, I'm not called to go overseas whatsoever. But the Holy Spirit had different plans. And he worked in me. So just to tell you just a couple things as I finish, some of the things that are going on. One of the things we do is we do a thing called soup and stories at our house on Friday nights where people come over, they have soup, they have dinner, and we tell stories of faith, real stories of stuff that's happened in our life, biblical stories. And through that, there was this little boy who started coming that didn't know Jesus. And we gave him a comic book Bible. And there might be a picture of that in there of the soup and stories. But uh, we gave him a comic book Bible, and he read it entirely in two days, and he said it was his favorite book. And so just little things like this. And my favorite thing that's been happening is this men's ministry that we call Meldrum Men. Because there's not stuff for men. They can go to the pub, they can sit at home, but that's it. There's just not men's organization. So we created this place for men to come and to hang out, to have really good food, and we've deemed it the Ministry of Smoked Meats uh, within our own little circle because one of the greatest ministry tools I ever bought was an electric smoker. And I began smoking barbecue in a place that does not have barbecue. And their favorite is smoked chicken wings. I can cook these real cheap and I can cook 14 pounds of chicken wings at one time. And guys will come just for the chicken wings and to come and hang out and have fellowship with one another, to have support from one another, and um, so much so that it's opened a doorway where now we have this opportunity to actually hold men's retreat at a farm um, in the middle of just this beautiful area of Scotland uh, so men can get away and not only have a retreat where they can deepen their faith, but also even if they don't have faith, to get away, to recharge, and then to find support as well. And so there's doors that are continually opening uh, and stuff we're doing. And there's tons of other stuff, tons of other stories, stuff that Shannon's doing with, with working with women and uh, providing lactation support um, and nursery groups and all of these things. And so what I would like to invite you to do is if you, if you have Facebook, you can open up Facebook now. And if you search Clan Stellhorn on your phone on Facebook, you can find our Facebook page. And on there, you will see all kinds of updates and stories that we share. And we were doing a lot of stuff with our blog on our website, but we had to pull that back because it was just a little too public. So a lot of the updates are through our Facebook page, and you'll see weekly updates, two or three times a week of all the stuff that's kind of going on and happening. And with that, we would love to invite you and your family to consider making our family your missionary family. That your family takes us up as the family that you support. That you pray for us, 
that you invest a little time and learn about what we're doing. And if you feel called to even support us monthly, uh, financially, uh, in the work that's happening in Scotland, because we could not do it without the financial support of those who are following us and, and supporting us so dearly um, to provide these things that are happening and providing the change that's even now happening in Scotland. So if this morning you would like to take up that challenge and begin praying for us, um, just take one of those papers that are at the back of our table. It has our picture. Stick it on the, uh, the fridge at your house. And as well, if you're in a place where you would like to make us your missionary family and uh, uh, financially support us every month, that would also provide ways for us to open the door for these retreats, for uh, the work that we're doing with the men, with the local churches and house churches. We're supporting uh, two or three house churches right now, one in Alford, Scotland, uh, the one we've been working with in Meldrum, uh, possibly starting one in Dice, and we're starting, uh, we're supporting one down at the farm that is down near Bankery. So four different house churches right now are being supported through us. And as well, I would love to invite you back to our table after everything's over. There's some stuff to try. There's some, some cookies and some local sweets. There's stuff to look at, touch, feel. There's coloring pages, um, all of those kind of stuff, just to get a feel for what it's like in Scotland and even a little bit of a taste. Um, I don't have any barbecue because there's no barbecue in Scotland, uh, but there is chicken wings at our house. So uh, that's just a little bit there. So thank you very much for giving me your time and your attention this morning, and uh, especially as it's getting close to lunchtime and uh, all those kind of things. Thank you very much, and I'll be back to we're you. Gonna, we're going to pray for you. Yep. Me. Who wants to see Josh eat a fish pie? <laughs> I'm out on the fish pie. Uh, they had fish every morning in Israel, and I was just not game. So we're going to pray for you, uh, and then we'll transition to Lord's Supper. But thanks for being here. Listen, who would have thought somebody from Santa Fe would be sent on mission, right? When we answer the call of God, he can do amazing things to us. Uh, you never know. Chris is going to be back here. Please connect with him. I know some of our church members do support him. Uh, so get that connection going on. Keep praying for his family. Join me in praying with him right now. I'm going to pray, but as I pray, feel free to lift them up in prayer as well. Father, thank you so much for the Stellhorns, Lord. Um, God, we pray that as he flies back to Scotland tomorrow, God, you would give him an excitement uh, to, to, to be back where you've called him, Lord. And, and God, I pray that we hear many more connections being made, people putting faith in Christ and the gospel getting out. We pray that those home churches take off, they get off the ground, you bless them, Lord. Give Chris and his wife and family wisdom, Lord, as they make friends, as they do life there. Thank you for sending them. And, and Lord, I pray that you bless his parents back home here, uh, even in our church, Lord. Bless them, God. I know they miss their kids, their grandkids. But Lord, we pray you take care of them. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to transition now uh, to the Lord's Supper quickly. And as we do this, this is what we'll do. Before our deacons come forward, I want everybody to, uh, you can just bow your heads, spend some time with the Lord, getting right with God. Uh, so confess some sins, get your heart, mind right as we do the Lord's Supper, and then we'll begin here in about 30 seconds. Now we've had just a moment to kind of align our hearts with the Lord. We're going to begin the process of taking communion, and this is how we'll do it. Mark's going to pray for us, uh, and then we'll pass out the bread. Hold on to it, because I'll read a scripture, and then we'll eat it together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together to remember your sacrifice that you've made for us, Lord. Pray that we, you would help us to remember that as we take your body, um, and uh, remember all that you've done for us in that sacrifice. In Jesus' name I pray.
Now, next week, we'll talk uh, in depth about the theology of the Lord's Supper and, and what it means. Um, but this is celebrating what Christ has done for us, the laying down of his body, the belief in him, and the freedom from sin and death that we have. He writes in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, instructions on the Lord's Supper, but this is what Paul says. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may eat the bread. In the same way, I'm going to have uh, Gene pray uh, before we take the cup. They'll pass it out. I'll read a scripture, and then we'll take the cup. Father, as we come to this time to remember the sacrifice that you made for us by sending your son, the spilt blood, I just pray today, Father, as we take the resemblance of it, that we will evaluate our lives and where we are with you. Lord, we just thank you so much for loving us that you gave your only son, that we may have eternal life. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
The scriptures read, In the same way he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it and remember to me. You may take the cup. Amen. Well, hey, I love you guys. Thank you for being here today. Be sure and see Chris before you leave. If you're visiting with us, I would love to meet you. Um, Stephen's going to lead us in a song, and then we'll be dismissed after that. Would you stand and worship with us? These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trial, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee. And out of Zion till salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as wide in your world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. Out of Zion till salvation comes. And there is no one like you, Lord. Sing it out. There is no God like Jehovah. 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 There's 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 no God like Jehovah. Behold, He comes riding on clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. And out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Oh, behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. And out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Oh, and lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. And out of Zion's hill, salvation comes.